So hello everyone and welcome to this lecture recap. And we're going to continue today talking about waves. So last lecture, we mainly focused on qualitative aspects. We wanted to understand how you go from our understanding of oscillators to our uh, an understanding of the phenomenon of propagating waves. And we thought about a simple situation where you would have a bunch of oscillators but they're actually coupled together, for example, by some springs. And then we understood that in that situation, if you displace one of the oscillators, it's going to oscillate about its equilibrium position. But then because it's connected to the neighboring oscillators, it will also drive an oscillation in the nearby oscillators. And so you'll basically transfer some of your energy of oscillation to the next oscillator, and then that will cause the next oscillator to start oscillating. And then that first oscillator, if we just displaced it and let it go, it'll eventually settle back to its equilibrium position because its energy has been given up to the next oscillators. And so you end up getting this traveling pulse along the chain of oscillators that is a type of a wave. And we understood that this kind of situation provides a nice model for what happens in a solid material or even a liquid or a gas where you think of collections of molecules as being the masses in our simple model. And so, for example, if you just have a stretched string and you think of a, a small part of that string, then if you displace that upward a little bit, we understood last time that the tension forces act as then a restoring force that will pull it back downward and so it's like an oscillator. It's like a it's like a system in mechanical equilibrium, but it's also coupled to all the other neighboring parts of the string. And so that string is behaving really just like this chain of oscillators. And so if you displace the string at some point, then you create waves that move along the string. And then even in higher dimensions, we can think about the same thing. Now the oscillators are are either individual molecules in a solid or, or you can think of larger collections of molecules. And so if you displace those, so for example, when this brick hits the ground, then the bottom layer gets compressed. And so then that bottom layer of molecules is, is, is well, number one, feeling a restoring force from the molecules above it, but also it's pressing on the molecules above it through Newton's third law. And so then those get compressed and then the next layer gets compressed. And so you end up generating these kinds of waves throughout the solid traveling from the bottom to the top. And then they can bounce back and you end up with a vibration. Okay, so mathematically, we then talked about how do you describe one of these waves? And we focused on the simple situation of one dimensional waves. So we could imagine that we're talking about a stretch string there's one position direction, which we're going to call X along the string. And then if we want to describe what is the wave doing at any time, then we have to give some function of X. So that would be this D of X. And there would be a function for time equals zero and a different function for time equals one and a different function for time equals two. And you see in this simple example, these functions correspond to a particular wave shape and then the, that just moves to the right at a certain velocity. So that's not always true in realistic waves. Sometimes the wave shape itself spreads out as the wave travels along. And so in general, we basically just need some function of two variables where plugging in some particular value for time, then you're left with a function of one variable and that gives you your shape. And so we're gonna talk today about what kind of a function would correspond to this simple behavior of a wave just moving to the right without changing its shape. But we're going to talk about something even more specific today, which is a very important type of wave, comes up in a lot of applications. And that is the case where the shape of the wave not only remains the same as it moves, say, from left to right, but the shape of the wave is a sinusoidal function. Okay, and now this is different than the kind of sinusoidal functions we were talking about before in that we were always talking about functions of time 
So when we had a cos omega t plus phi, that was talking about an individual oscillator oscillating up and down. And we were plotting the time dependence of the height or the displacement for the oscillator. What I'm showing here is not the time dependence. This is the spatial dependence of a certain kind of a wave, for example, on a string. And so what it's showing is that as you go along the string, then the string is displaced upward at some points and downward at other points. And the actual shape of the wave looks like a sine function. Okay, so kind of like water waves, you're familiar with the, sh the basic shape of water waves that the surface of the water is displaced relative to the flat plane in a kind of a sinusoidal shape. All right, so we're going to talk about this and the time dependence. So in the traveling wave, this thing would be moving to the right at a certain velocity. Okay, and that velocity is then one of our key parameters when we're talking about waves. We'll see how the velocity is sort of determined by the properties of the system that you're talking about. Another new parameter relative to when we were thinking about oscillations is the wavelength. And so that is just the physical distance between one peak of the wave and the next peak of the wave. So these are kind of the new parameters that, we, that we're going to think about. And then you still have the same kind of parameters that relate to the time dependence. So as this wave moves along, if I just look at one place on the string or on the surface of the water, or whatever kind of wave I'm, I'm looking at, if I just focus on one location and look at what that is doing as a function of time, then in this simple situation where you have a sinusoidal wave, that one point is just going to oscillate up and down. And so you could imagine as this wave here moves to the right, right now the point at the origin is at its highest place. But then as the wave moves, it's going to go down and then up and then down and up and up and so forth. Okay. And so we can still assign a period to this wave, which is just that period of oscillation for that one point. And the period is the same wherever you look on the wave. And you can take the inverse of that to talk about the frequency of the wave. Okay, so the first thing I wanna to do today is help you understand a very important relationship that we have between the velocity of a wave and the period or frequency of the wave and the wavelength. So it turns out that these things are not all independent of each other. Okay, and here to help us understand this, we have Baby Shark. So have a read through this question. It's a situation where Baby Shark is floating in the water. He happens to be right now at the top of a wave. And we're saying that these water waves are going to be moving to the right at a certain velocity, 0 0.5 meters per second. And so as a result, Baby Shark is going to be bobbing up and down. And so your question is just a really basic question. At what time will Baby Shark next reach a maximum height? Okay. So pause the video, think about that for a moment. Choose one of these answers. And now we're going to talk about it. Okay, so which color am I going to use? I had a nice green one somewhere. Oh, there it is. I'm going to use emerald green today. So. Here's our picture. We've got baby shark and the wave is moving along at 0 0.5 meters per second. And so to answer this question, we really don't need to use anything beyond like really simple kinematics, just the relationship between distance and speed and time. Because what you see is that as the wave moves to the right, the shark will be at the maximum position again, basically when this wave crest reaches the position of the shark. Okay, so if I were to draw um, the wave at a slightly later time, then it'll look like this and the shark will have gone down to the bottom. And then at a later time than that, this wave crest will have moved all the way to the shark. Okay, so it moves, it moves, it moves. And then the shark will have gone back up to the top. Okay, and so the amount of time before the shark is back up to the highest position, it's just going to be the amount of time that it takes 
for this wave to move three meters. And so we want to take that the time is equal to three meters divided by this velocity, 0 0.5 meters per second. And so that's going to take six seconds. And so then for this question, the answer is D. So that was really straightforward, I think. But it tells us something very important about waves. Okay, so what it tells us in general is a relation between the period. That's what we calculated in that question. The period is how long it takes for the shark to be at the top of the oscillation and then come back to the top of the oscillation again. And what we did was we said that the period was equal to that wavelength divided by the wave velocity. So we just derived this crucial formula about waves relating period, wavelength, and velocity. And so that's something that you'll probably use over and over again in this course and other courses. Another version of that, which is maybe even more common, is to write the period as one over the frequency. And so then our relation that we just derived gives us a relation between velocity, frequency, and wavelength. Okay, so V equals lambda times F. And so that's very commonly used, for example, when you're talking about electromagnetic radiation. If you have like the five gigahertz frequency radiation that's used for some Wi-Fi signals or, or cell phone signals, and you wanted to figure out what is the wavelength of that wave, well, then you would just use this formula where V would be the speed of light and you use your frequency and then you can calculate the wavelength. Okay. So this is a good thing to remember. These three quantities are not all independent of one another. So next, we're going to try to understand this function that I was talking about, d of x comma t. I want to understand what that is for one of these traveling sinusoidal waves. And our first step is going to be to understand what is the wave, how do we write the wave displacement just at one particular time. So I'll, I'll start out, imagine that we take a picture of our wave at time equals zero, we plot out the displacement as a function of position at that time. And then we want to know what is this function d of x at t equals zero. Okay, so take a moment to think about this and then we are going to go through it. All right, so let's talk about this question. And what I want to point out is that it is basically the same kind of thing that we've been doing for the past couple of weeks, thinking about time dependence, except now on the x-axis, we have position instead of time. Okay, And so we're trying to write so we notice that the displacement amplitude is four millimeters. And so all of these functions are four millimeters and then times some cosine function. And we want to figure out what goes here. And so let, let me just quickly remind you of what we would have done if this were a function of time. Okay, so if if we had that graph, but it was talking about the time dependence of an oscillator, then we would have said that the form of the function, we would have said that it's d equals a cos omega t. And we would have said that omega is equal to 2 pi divided by the period. And then we would have looked at the distance between these two peaks on the time graph, and that would have been the period that we would use for this. And so here the mathematics is exactly the same, but instead 
we have x as our variable. But in order to figure out what goes here, we still just look at this distance between the peaks. But now it's the wavelength, because we're talking about position instead of time. And so we actually write a different thing, which is d equals a times cos. And then I'll just call this number in front of x a different thing, because it's no longer a frequency. It's multiplying x. It's the thing that we call wave number. So this is the th this is the thing that we're trying to find in this question is the wave number. And the way to get it is then to just take 2 pi and divide it by the wavelength. And so I'll explain, I'll explain why that is in a moment, but let's just do it for this question. So we notice that in this question, lambda is equal to one meter. And so in this question, our answer is C that it's two pi over one meter. Okay, but let's understand why this is. So we, we kind of use the analogy with our time dependent graphs. Why is this the right answer if we wanna just understand this from first principles? And so the reason that we can understand this to be the answer in general is that we notice that after one wavelength, we go back up to the top. So it's a cosine function, but what we want is if we plug in x equals the wavelength, then the thing inside the cosine should be two pi. Okay, so because that's what it would be if you've gone through a full period. And if we plug in x equals two lambda, then we want to get four pi. And so you could see that if we have this form of the function, cosine of two pi divided by lambda, and then we plug in x equals lambda. Once, once you've gone through a full wavelength, then you're back at cosine of theta equals one. And then as you go through another wavelength, again, you're back at cosine theta equals one. Okay. So you can use that direct kind of first principles approach to understand this, or you could use the analogy with frequency and period. Okay. So the bottom line is that we just understood how to figure out what we're calling wave number. So when you have a sinusoidal function of position describing your wave, and you want to figure out this number that's in front of x inside the cosine, all you do is you look at the wavelength and you take k to be equal to 2 pi divided by the wavelength. All right, so our next goal is to understand the time dependence. So when we have our wave at time equals zero, we now understand that you can write it as a cosine and you can write the wave number in terms of the wavelength. If this thing were shifted left or right relative to the pure cosine, then you could also include a phase and you would include that in exactly the same way that you would for the time graphs, okay? So the phase would just be, you'd look at the fraction of the, of the, in this case, wavelength that it's shifted left or right, and then you'd multiply that by two pi. Okay, so what about the time dependence? So in this question, we have a function f of x. It's not a sine function, so I'm just momentarily stepping back from that specific case to a more general case. So imagine you have this wave at time zero, its displacement as a function of position is described by this function f of x. And then it's moving to the right at some velocity v. And what I wanna know is what function describes my wave at time t? So think about that for a little bit and then we'll talk about it. All right, so let's go here. What we have is that at time zero, the function is f of x. And then we can say that at time t, the wave has moved by a certain distance to the right. What is that distance? It's just 
the velocity times this time. And it's moved to the right. And so in this case, our function is the same function. It's the same shape, but it's shifted to the right by an amount vt. And so instead of f of x, then we just use like our basic mathematics to recall that if I want to shift a function to the right, I just subtract that amount from its argument. So instead of f of x, I get f of x minus vt. It's the same thing when we were talking about adding or subtracting phases. Okay, so shifting to the right, you get a minus sign. Shifting to the left, you get a plus sign. So the answer for this one is e that d of x and t is f of x minus vt. Okay. As I mentioned, if it happened to be a left moving wave, then this would have shifted to the left and then we would have added vt. So using that idea and using our understanding that say for this wave here, the initial function describing the wave is a cosine, so we can now put these things together and say that for a traveling sinusoidal wave, where the initial shape is cosine 2 pi over lambda x, then at some later time, this is going to be the function of x. So you just have to replace x with x minus vt. And now we have the entire, we have this function that tells us the displacement at any time at any position. And if it were moving to the left, then it would be x plus vt, okay? So that's one way that we could write the wave. Let me just write, I'll just do a couple of steps of algebra here to show you a different way that's a little bit more common. So I'm going to start with a times cos two pi over lambda x minus vt. And then I'll just notice that I can expand things out. So first I'll write 2 pi over lambda times x and then minus 2 pi v over lambda times t. And now I can remember our relation between velocity and wavelength and frequency. So if I insert that thing, then I get a times the cosine of 2 pi over lambda times x, and then minus 2 pi times the frequency times t. But what's even more common is to then just write that first thing, 2 pi over lambda, that's what we called k. And then we notice 2 pi over 2 pi times f is the same thing as the angular frequency. And so we can kind of write the entire thing as a cos of kx minus omega t. That would be for the right moving wave. And then for the left moving wave, we would just replace that minus sign with a plus sign. Okay, and so this is a form of the wave function, the wave um, equation, the displacement equation for a wave that you'll often see. So at this point, we have a lot of letters flying around. Many of them are Greek. And I just want to emphasize that there aren't really that many different properties of a wave. So there's really only two independent things. And one of them is the wavelength. So that's easy to read off if you actually have a picture of a wave or a plot of the wave displacement as a function of position. And that's directly related to the wave number. So lambda equals 2 pi over k, k equals 2 pi over lambda. That's one piece of information about your wave. The next piece of information, so that's related to the spatial displacement function. The next piece of information is this frequency or period or angular frequency. All of those things are related. So that's just looking at your wave and seeing how quickly is it oscillating up and down. Okay. The time for a complete oscillation is the period. The frequency is the inverse of that. The angular frequency is 2 pi times that. And the final thing we have is the velocity of the wave. How quickly is it moving? 
And we've understood that you can figure this out if you have one of these two things and one of these three things. Okay, so the velocity is determined by the wavelength and the period. Okay, so a, a standard kind of question you would need to do is to figure out for some given wave, maybe we describe the wave or we give you some graphs or whatever, you want to figure out what function this is. What is A? What is K? What is omega? And we've already done an example to figure out what K is, right? You just look at the wavelength. That's usually pretty easy. 2 pi over the wavelength is K. And so here's a question that kind of allows you to complete the process. Of course, the amplitude is also very easy. You just look at how high does it go up relative to the zero position. And so in this one, we assume that we've already figured out the amplitude, we've already figured out the K, and now your job is here to complete the process, figure out what this last part of the function in there is. Okay, And we're giving you the plot of the wave, not just at one time, but at a whole bunch of times. So you could really see what, what's happening here. All right, so let's do this. Um, okay, I barely even need to write anything down here. I'll start with our general form of the wave. And so once I write this down, what I realize is that in this question, all we need to determine is the omega. And in order to determine omega, we can use that that is related to the period by omega equals 2 pi over t. Now let's look at the period. So we have this wave. And to find the period, what we can do is focus on one specific spatial location. I'll focus on x equals 0 here. And I just want to watch that location and see how long it takes for one complete oscillation. So at time equals 0, the wave at x equals 0 is at its maximum displacement. And then it falls down at time equals 3, and then to the, to the sort of maximum displacement in the other direction at time equals 6. And then it comes back up to 0 at time equals 9. And then finally, at time equals 12 seconds, we're back up to the top. And so t is 12 seconds from the graph, which is just the period. It's like the oscillation period for a single point in x. So I could have equally well looked at this point at 1 meter. That also decreases to 0 and comes back up to the top at 12 seconds. Or I could have looked at this point at 0 0.5 meters. Doesn't really matter. You're going to get the same period regardless of which point you're looking at. So plugging things in here, what we find is that omega equals 2 pi over 12 seconds. And then that would be answer number C here. So that's the correct answer for this question. All right, so here's another one. We're back with baby shark. We've also got duck. Duck is watching baby shark and duck is very interested in baby shark's vertical velocity. So duck notices that baby shark is bobbing up and down as this wave passes by and baby and duck wants to figure out what is the maximum speed that baby shark is going to have during this bobbing up and down. So think about that for a little bit and see if you can come up with the answer. So let's talk about this one. We have basically the only thing we need to realize is that we can do the same thing as we've been doing all along. So Baby shark is oscillating. And so from the point of view of an oscillator, we already understood 
that the maximum velocity is going to be the amplitude of the oscillation times the angular frequency of the oscillation. Okay, so that still applies because the time dependence of baby shark is still the same. The time dependence of baby shark is going to be a cos of omega t plus, plus something, plus some phase, if we plug in whatever baby shark's location is. And so the way we got this formula was just take, take the derivative of that, and that would tell us that the velocity of baby shark in the vertical direction is minus a omega sine of omega t plus phi. Okay, so it could be a little bit confusing here because now there's a wave velocity as well, but that is not directly related to the up-down velocity of baby shark. So what we want to do is just use our knowledge of oscillations. We use this equation, and now we can figure out, well, we know what amplitude is. It's one meter. What about omega? So we just use the same kind of logic that we had previously. Omega would be two pi over the period, um, but now we can use the we can figure out the period using the wavelength and the velocity. Okay, so we have that the period is equal to like in our very first question from today, the wavelength divided by the velocity. And so that gives us that omega is 2 pi times v divided by lambda once I plug that in. And now I just calculate everything. So that's 2 pi times 0 0.5 meters per second divided by 3 meters. And so our v max is equal to one meter times that two pi times 0 0.5 meters per second divided by three meters, whatever that comes out to. So pi over three meters per second. Okay, so you see it's different. It's not really the same thing as this velocity, which is the velocity of those wave crests. The up and down velocity is something that involves not only that velocity, but also how much amplitude you have and uh, what is what is the wavelength? Um, okay, so I, I just have a couple of bonus slides here that we didn't talk about these in the regular class, but since I have them here, might as well go through them. Uh, extra question, which graph rep represents the duck's vertical displacement as a function of time? So in this question, you want to go from the picture, which is like a snapshot graph. So the picture is like the wave at some instant in time. And then we just want to understand what is the, the, the function that describes the duck's vertical position if we run the movie forward and watch what happens with the duck. So think about that. Um, and so if you think about it, What's going to happen with the duck is that you see it's kind of in the middle. It's at the equilibrium position at the start. And then the only thing to understand is does the duck then move up or does it move down? And what happens is that she moves up. So, so this wave goes forward a little bit. And so then the duck is going to be lifted by the wave. And uh, so that corresponds to answer A, where you're originally at zero, then you're lifted, and then later you're at the maximum position. Okay. And so that's kind of a standard kind of question that you'll have. We had one last class where you're going from the snapshot graph to the history graph. And so you notice that the history graph for duck looks a little bit different from the history graph for baby shark, who starts at the top and then goes downward and then comes back up. So that's all for today. Next week, we're going to do several interesting applications of wave physics. And so we'll get into that on Monday. One thing I mentioned to the regular class is that, so today's lecture is kind of the, the, the end of what you can expect to see in the written portion of our exam. But next week, we'll go through a couple of concepts that could appear in the multiple choice. So next week's lectures are also important. 
but um, in terms of the written portion, in terms of like what's showing up on your homework this week, that's basically all been covered now um, after today's lecture. Have a good weekend.